Thank you so much. Um, well, welcome everyone, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I really want to thank the Cheech and the amazing staff for hosting this event today. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to work with you all um, at this really incredible museum. And I'd also like to thank Ed Gomez, April Lillard Gomez, and Luis Hernandez for inviting me to join the curatorial team of the Mexicali Biennial. Um, this has been probably one of the most exciting and rewarding uh, projects that I've ever done. And it's even more wonderful when your collaborators become <coughs> your friends um, and see you through some really important uh, life kind of events. So the aim of today's symposium is to look back at the history of the Mexicali Biennial since its founding in 2006 and to relate the Biennial's past and present exhibitions to some of the key issues and debates in contemporary art, California, Baja California, and the US-Mexico borderlands. The title of this symposium is drawn from the exhibition, Art Actions Exchanges, that is currently on view in the small gallery uh, adjacent to this room. And so we curators have come to know of this exhibition as the archive show, uh, because it displays art objects, photographs, and ephemera from past exhibitions. However, it is very much a living, regenerating archive, because several of the artworks and actions from past Mexica the Biennial exhibitions are reimagined and reactivated within the gallery space. So since 2006, each biennial has been organized around a curatorial concept, researched by April Lillard Gomez and other curators. And the artists are selected on the basis of an open call system. This format allows any and all artists to submit proposals for the biennial, even those without gallery representation. This model is quite unique in the contemporary art world and it's rooted in the founder's commitment uh, and their original vision that the Mexicali Biennial needs to be an anti-biennial. The Biennial is also unique in its commitment to showcasing artists from both sides of the US-Mexico border. So all artists usually have some connection to both Californias, and many of them work in the borderlands region. The exhibitions have reflected the diversity of artists and medias shaping contemporary art more broadly. And I would argue that the biennial has been at the forefront of artistic innovation. Now, despite the range of curatorial concepts and the diversity of artists, several key themes run through all of the past exhibitions. And today's symposium uh, will explore three of these themes. Now the first panel is anti-biennial, and it's based on the curator's commitment to an exhibition project that challenges established biennial models and the traditional emphasis on global cities as dominant cultural centers. The first biennial was held in 2006 at La Casa de la Tia Tina, an independent art space in Mexicali. And since then, the biennial has remained true to this alternative ethos. It is artist-centered, nomadic, transgressive, and binational. And it is invested in artists and community building, not art markets and tourism. Our first panel will situate the Mexicali Biennial in relation to bigger debates about exhibition models, established art institutions, and independent spaces in California and Baja California. The second panel, Ready Made Border, will launch a discussion about the border and the borderlands in contemporary art. For some time now, artists from around the world have drawn inspiration from the US-Mexico border wall and often appropriated the border in monumental artworks. And this panel will highlight two of the Mexicali Biennial's distinct interventions in the history of border art. First, its commitment to site specificity, and second, 
its conception of the border as a ready-made. The ready-made concept is closely associated with Marcel Duchamp and other artists who took a prefabricated or mass-produced object, such as a urinal, and modified its fixed function with artistic intent and reintroduced the works as art in a museum or gallery. Now, a number of Mexicali Biennial artists have rendered the border as a ready-made by creating works that directly use the structure as a media for installations and performances, several which, as I've mentioned, are reimagined, reactivated in the archive show. So how do you take an object that has an assumed form and function and transform it into something else. This panel uh, discusses how biennial artists have worked with the border as a ready-made and as an idea in conceptual art. And in the process, their works reveal the limits and failures of the wall itself. They also reimagine the peoples, histories, and geographies that the border is supposed to divide. Now, over the years, the Biennial has consistently invited artists and curators to interrogate the history and mythology of both Californias and of North America more broadly. This year's Land of Milk and Honey exhibition, which is currently on view, uh, is, a, I think, a really excellent case in point. Our third panel, Colonial Mythologies, will initiate a discussion about the legacies of colonial conquest and westward expansion in North America, about the representation of race, gender, indigeneity, and nation, and about decolonial strategies for art and curatorial practice. Now, at today's symposium, we are delighted to feature a number of artists and curators who've worked with the Biennial over the years, uh, from curators and scholars whose work intersects with the Biennial and from founding curators, Ed Gomez and Luis Hernandez. So just a few words about the format. Uh, each of the panels will last about one hour, with each panelist speaking for about 12 to 15 minutes. And then this will be followed by uh, moderators' comments and a Q&A with the audience. Uh, we will then break for lunch after the second panel, and then end with a celebratory toast at the conclusion of the third panel. So without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming our first panel, uh, which is moderated by Joseph Daniel Valencia, curator of exhibitions at the Vincent Price Art Museum in Los Angeles, where he also directs the Advancing Latinx Art and Museums Initiative. So thank you. Um, thank you, Rosalia, for that really wonderful introduction and situate our, our day together. Um, as moderator, I just want to do an intro, a brief intro of who we'll have speaking today, and of course, following the format. I didn't mean to yank the, <laughs> yank the mic, Ed. Um, but of course, you know, we have the honor of thinking, starting this symposium with thinking about exhibition models and also exhibition spaces and where artists uh, make work and where that work is presented, which um, can be a scholarly and or theoretical kind of conversation, but it's really important to center it on the lived experiences of artists and makers, and so I'm really excited to think about that. Um, so really briefly, you know, Ed Gomez, artist, curator, educator in Los Angeles, in 2006 co-founded the Mexicali Biennial, which as we'll discuss today has not only served as an artist project and curatorial project, but also as a critique and satirical comment on the art biennial format globally. Uh, he is Associate Professor of Art at Cal State San Bernardino and received his BFA in a ASU and MFA from Otis. And after Israel Ortega will speak, uh, art installer and curator, experience working across art institutions in the United States and Mexico. Um, and since the 2000s has been deeply involved in uh, art spaces in Mexicali and with the US-Mexico borderlands. Uh, often working and collaborating with many local independent um, art spaces, right? Uh, so, and I have a list here, you know, Juanita Lowe Gallery at Imperial Valley College, Mexicali Rose, Arma, Planta Libre, Atmosferas, uh, Rizoma, uh, Arca, Escritorio de Procesos, and he currently works as visitor 
visual arts coordinator at Cerate Mexicali, which is the state art center um, in Baja California, as well as art installer uh, and curator at CETIS University. We also have a, a panelist who will be zooming in, correct? <laughs> so real briefly, Alejandro Espinosa. Oh, Alejandro Espinosa is a professor and researcher uh, of the Faculty of Arts at the Autonomous University of Baja California, Mexicali campus. Uh, and for the past 15 years has been a leading researcher and writer of the history of art in Baja California, both as a critic and as a form um, of curatorial texts and exhibitions and in a variety of spaces in the borderlands. Um, I should note that he wrote a wonderful text um, called Border Emergences and Interferences, which was included as part of the Mexicali Baniel's Library of Congress um, Research Guide, which I hope he'll have a moment to discuss that as well. So I'll pass it back off to Ed uh, to start us off. Thank you. Great, thank you. So I wanted to um, start out first talking about what is the Mexicali Biennium, right? I think um, some of you collaborators or partners out there are like, well, we already know this. But for everybody else, I think it's a good opportunity to kind of talk a little bit about um, what we are and how we started. So basically what we are now is a nonprofit arts uh, contemporary organization uh, <coughs> focusing on the area encompassing California and Mexico as an area of aesthetic production. Uh, the program or the project itself is migratory in nature. <coughs> and we showcase uh, artists' actions and performances on both sides of the U.S.-Mexico border with artists that live, work, or have some type of relationship with the border and the region. So then the question is, that how did it start? Well, the Biennial was originally started as an art project conceived by myself and artist Luis Hernandez, who's also here will be on the panel uh, shortly, uh, as a way of, of critiquing the proliferation of international and regional art biennials and to play with the way the word biennial can change the context of an exhibition that just, at this, for this example, happened to be in Mexicali, Mexico. Um, since the word Mexicali is a portmanteau, it's the merger of um, the, the words Mexico and California, we decided to use the word Mexicali as a ready-made and structured and the proposed exhibition around the binational connections and exchanges that happen every day between neighboring countries. The word Mexicali was also used to form the overarching structure of the exhibition platform in that the proposed exhibitions would be uh, binational and have exchanges. Since 2006, the Biennial has showcased artists and collectors on both sides of the U.S.-Mexico border in alternative and traditional spaces with select works activating the border itself. As an alternative art program, exhibitions can happen outside or without the confines of, an, of a traditional biennial model. Uh, art programs can take place outside the two-year limit and host actions and performances along the U.S.-Mexico border if, and within the broader Mexico-California region. This presentation will primarily focus on projects that, are, that occurred on the physical border between California and Mexico uh, between 2006 and 2020. It was in 2005 that my colleague Luis Hernandez and I were invited to produce an exhibition with Los Angeles-based artists uh, in an alternative art space run by Guilberto Monreal called La Casa de la Tia Tina. We co-ran the space with uh, uh, Mexicali artist Ismael Castro. Now, um, Tia Tina was not a typical white cube exhibition space, and in fact, it was more widely known as a venue for young artists to do pop-up shows, and a place for local Chicali and American punk bands to play at. The inaugural Mexicali Banya took place there in 2006 at La Casa de la Tia Tina Espacio Alternativo de Arte y Musica, the alternative art space located in a residential area in Mexicali within walking distance between the U.S.-Mexico border. The exhibition space consisted of a, an abandoned home an open courtyard sandwiched between a burned out and haunted garage and a one bedroom home that served as an entrance to the space. Yet Dina's proximity to the US-Mexico border served both as a physical and conceptual backdrop that framed the exhibition in the borderlands and politics and dialogues. As part of the overarching program in 2006, there were no curatorial limitations on the exhibited works. 
the selected artists were open to addressing the U.S.-Mexico border as either a site that was either physical or conceptual, while experiencing firsthand the process of traversing the U.S.-Mexico border and the cultural bleed that happens where countries meet. The second phase of the Biennial was a multimedia art event with visual artists, live bands, oops, live bands, and DJs from Los Angeles and Hikali that was held at Chavez Studios in East Los Angeles. The Los Angeles-based artist Mike Rogers' performance and installation titled Telefon Telefono was part of the Diatina exhibition in 2006 and consisted of two 10-foot telephone poles, two 10-foot poles on either side of the U.S.-Mexico border between Calexico and Icali, and the poles were connected by a string and tin cans of a child's telephone game. Mike Rogers writes, for me, the Mexicali Biennial offered an opportunity to address the xenophobia that is percolating in much of the United States. My project called Telefon Telefono was designed as an instrument to foster cross-border communication and consisted of two structures, one placed in the U.S. and one in Mexico along the calexico Mexicali border. Users could climb on top where they could pick up the cups or phones, see each other while talking. And as passerbys would come and see us doing this performance, we'd ask them if they wanted to make a free collect call or free free international call to the U.S. <laughs> as they're waiting in line for hours across. <laughs> the next biennial did not take place until 2009, three years after the first, and was held in four different locations spanning two years in two different countries. The second biennial focused or highlighted the work of artists from California and Mexico that interrogated the economies of exchange, constructs of race, nationalism, art, and identity in a region while insisting on a transgressive fluidity between media and territory. The Mexico-based venues for the 0910 biennial were, uh, La, Casa, um, Mexicali, uh, were the La Casa de Tunel in Tijuana, um, Mexicali Rose, Centro de Arte Medios, and the uh, Sala de Arte at UABC in Mexicali. Casa de Tunel Art Space was an artist-run gallery located in the Colonia Federal neighborhood in Tijuana and was part of the tijuana Pace arts organization titled Consejo Fronteriza de Arte y Cultura, the Border Art, a Council of Art and Culture. It was founded by tijuana based artist Luis Ituarte and served as a neighborhood resource for art and um, the building itself was formerly uh, a nursery that was uh, selling plants to local tourists and quickly became known as La Casa de Tunel after a narco drug smuggling tunnel underneath the building was discovered in 2004. The tunnel in the basement of Casa de Tunel linked Tijuana to the adjacent parking lot in San Isidro, the port of San Diego, where drugs could quickly be smuggled from one country to the other. Now, Guadalajara-based artist Susana Rodriguez utilized the border wall directly behind Casa de Tunel to create her text piece called Salga de la Cárcel Gratis, or Get Out of Jail Free. Um, Susana Rodriguez writes, the project is a text piece that uses a phrase from the board game Monopoly. I intended to exploit the ambiguity of the sentence when it is located outside the context of the game and to cause different associations and connotations within the individual and collective experiences involved in social interactions. The artist used the history of the art space as context for the work, but also more broadly the role of the border itself. In 2009-10, the Vinyl also hosted uh, the Trans Border Game Project by our art collective Homeless, who consisted of uh, Christian Franco and Felipe Manzano that were based out of Guadalajara, Mexico. The Transborder Game performance consisted of a soccer match conducted on the international border between Calexico and Icali. Actually, I think the U.S. Uh, location for this is now a strip mall. I think there might be a, yeah. uh, like an old navy there or yeah. something. <laughs> <laughs> but we can still find it on the Mexicali side, right? The intervention attempted to condense aspects of the relationship ironically and concisely between Mexico and the United States including migration of illegal trafficking of goods. The soccer game was carried out on both sides of the border, with the border fence acting as the dividing line or the access for the midfield's pitch. Each player's uniform was printed with one of the last 11 presidents from each country's face, 
and evoked memories of historical events in the viewer and multiple partnerships. The work addressed confrontation, cooperation, competition, and exchanges between individuals that activated this piece. The ball's constant movement on both sides of the border and the invisibility of what happens on the other side illustrated the various bilateral relationships uh, between neighbors. And in the Art Actions and Exchanges exhibition next door, we, we have the, um, the opportunity of being able to see both sides of the game uh, in video format. The Biennial then traveled to the Otis College of Art Design at the Ben Wilds Gallery in Los Angeles and reflected on a year-long exploration and discussions about the physical and political realities crossing cultures, languages, and barriers. The third Mexicali Biennial was held in 2013 and engaged with the subject of cannibalism. Cannibalism in the New World was one of the central rationales for colonialism, and the Mexicali Biennial also proposed it as a pass forward a path forward towards a new avant-garde practice and model. In 2018, the Mexicali Biennial's um, Cannibalism in the New World was hosted by Mexicali Rose in Mexicali, the University Art Gallery at UABC, and the Vincent Price Art Museum on the campus of East Los Angeles College at Monterey Park uh, served as the California-based venue for the Colombia. In October 2018, the biennial kicked off with the program Manifest Calafia, Manifest in Terrestrial Paradise, and continued through 2019 and into early 2020. With uh, The project showcased dozens of artists from California and Mexico and sought to explore the spirit of California by using the mythological black female warrior Calafia, who was the namesake and the ruler of the fictitious island of California, as a source of inspiration and also artistic departure. Events and exhibitions occurred in Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibitions, Lace in Hollywood, the Robert and Francis Fullerton Museum of Art in San Bernardino, the Armory Center for the Arts in Pasadena, Steplin Gallery in Calexico, uh, Planta Libre Galeria Experimental in Mexicali, and also I-21 Art Space that's located in the Tianguis de Caballito, which is an indoor shopping mall in Mexicali. Curatorial research and project manager April Lillard writes, the parallels between the myth of California and current day inhabitants of the great state of California do not stop at its entomology. The phantasmagoric relationship can be seen through California's association throughout its history, its historical past and into the present. From the cinematic glamor of Hollywood to its identity as a fertile paradise, to its association with gold and riches, the story and the character of Calafia can be a point of critical interrogation used to explore and critique California's stories, contradictions, and identities. Camina Escobar's work titled Rituals of Propagation was performed along with artist Michaela Tobin on the Mexicali Calexico border as part of the Calafia exhibition in January of 2020. The performance consisted of two wooden megaphones positioned on each side of the US-Mexican border that were vocally activated. After Escobar's performance, spectators were invited to interact with the work by writing text directly onto the megaphone and to sing or by singing and yelling into each megaphone and having their voice travel over the border fence to create a sound inner space between realities. The Mexicali Biennial continues to provide artists with opportunities to respond and transgress the overarching environmental context of their work's production, display, and relation to the U.S.-Mexico border. We remain committed to giving artists opportunities with an artist-centered framework, and the less and often more innovative process of binational exchanges that happen every day. Thank you. Israel, do you have slides? Too? Yeah. You take them. yeah, that was such an important uh, introduction <laughs> and as well, just thinking about the different venues and projects and as well as artists involved. Um, but we'll we'll continue that hold that thought for now while we pull up Israel's presentation. Uh, first of all, uh, I I excuse my English. Uh, I will try to not be boring because uh, I 
tend to, when I talk English, uh, everybody starts to like to see. Uh, <clears throat> my, my point of view of, about the, this uh, symposium is uh, precisely to make a, like a timeline in all the projects that I've been involved with, Chicano, uh, Mexican, and Latin American art, and where uh, Mexicali Vineyard gets inserted, that I had the opportunity to work with them recent and also uh, Ed. So it's, uh, it's a list of shows uh, across the years. I've been working in this type of work uh, for 26 years, so there's, there's a lot of shows. Uh, <laughs> the first one that I, I remember very much was Ars Latina. We made it in Ser Mexicali in 2007. Uh, that show uh, was very important for me because a year earlier I had seen uh, I got a glimpse of the biennial in Casa de la Tia Tina. I think I met Luis there. It's kind of blurry those days. So uh, <laughs> uh, I don't remember meeting uh, Ed until uh, the next year, 2007. So uh, that show was very powerful for me because uh, I saw what, what art could do in an independent space. And when we had this show, Ars Latina, in, in, in where I work, which is a very uh, traditional institution. And in those days, it was uh, a, a lot more. Uh, well, we got a glimpse of uh, contemporary art in, in our space. So uh, those two pieces uh, come very, uh, uh, are very fun for me because I saw what the message of art beside aesthetics could do. And uh, the piece from Jose Hugo Sancho, which is a, uh, uh, it's a very bad photograph, but uh, there's uh, uh, the rifle is made out of, out of pollos, mm -hmm. and and it's shooting the American flag, which is uh, upside down. So we know that that's about immigration, right? Uh, it, it has to be, and it was a very powerful message. And, and then the other piece uh, on the side is a uh, a representation of 80 people disappeared, and I think the La Guerra Sucia. The, Argentina or something like that. I, I don't really have all, all the data, but uh, that's what I I, uh, I got a glimpse of the, in those days. And it was very powerful because it also had, uh, besides the pictures of, of each person disappeared, it had a glass of water. Maybe you can see it. A glass of water, which is also a performatic uh, uh, event because the, the, the water was consuming itself and, and during the ex exhibition. And, uh, and that gave me a glimpse of uh, how uh, our background, uh, our culture also gives, uh, gives us uh, uh, how to read a piece. I immediately uh, went to the, how the, uh, Dia de Muertos is for, for us Mexicans and, and to do that, like the, the thing of uh, things called uh, an altar and have food and, and beverages for, for the dead. So <coughs> then I, I came to learn that show that it was very powerful what we can do as installers and curators for a show because we had the opportunity to enhance the message of the artist. Uh, this was uh, a long time ago and uh, I tried since, since that I, I have tried to, in all my work, uh, do exactly that enhance the message of the arts. So, uh, uh, we have a very big break uh, with that show in, in Oka. It was the same year, a uh, friend of ours, uh, Greg Stone, we met him at Mexicali. He was a very weird guy. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, I'm total American, white American, but, but he was very fond of, uh, of, of La Frontera, of Tijuana, of uh, Mexicali. And all his painting is about uh, that specific things, uh, Tijuana border, uh, Mexicali, the sites, the scenes, uh, everything. And it was very curious for me to, to see that. Uh, he was very formal, very very traditional in the type of work he, he did, like a, like a picture, everything. He, he does the watercolor, that, that the, the illustration is a piece of him of the border. So we, he, he was uh, 
very appreciative of, of all the details. But he would love uh, that that culture uh, of the Mexican, the border culture. And he, he used to say that it was he was one eighth of Mexican. <laughs> I don't know what that means. But <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I know that. It's, it's, the thing is that we had that show. He made that show possible for us. Uh, 13 Mexican artists and 13 American artists at Oka. Uh, Richard Dufy was one of the persons presenting uh, uh, his piece uh, there. And it was very important for us. That we were practically new in the scene to have a show like that. That's uh, Eduardo Quintero's pieces, who is now at, at the Biennial, and he's, he's here, like sitting over there. Mm -hmm. and, and Pablo Castaneda have a piece here uh, at the And some of the guys that we, we started making like this, everything collective because we didn't have money, so we, we used to ship in for, for like, gas money and stuff to go and make the shows. And so that's, a, that's kind of a, how we started. We got another break of two, two of mine with Mario Torero. And that No Border show was in uh, Centro Cultural de la Raza. And almost the same artist, uh, Pablo Castañeda, Fernando Mendes Corona, which both are in, in the Bayern, uh, Lourdes Murillo, who disappeared. And now I think she's a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> disappeared from the arts here. <laughs> from the arts. <laughs> I hope that she, she can help us out when we have problems. But it, it's interesting that <coughs> in that same year I got to work with the Mexicali Biennial. It was a very, uh, work-wise, it was a very good year, 2009. And we we got to to help out in the piece that uh, Ed was talking about, the, the Susana Rodriguez, Salga uh, La Casa de Gratis. And the impact I saw and the people of the barrio, uh, uh, Pueblo Nuevo, which is a couple of, of blocks of, away from Mexicali Roads and, and situated in the barrio, uh, Mexicali Roads and that barrio, was that the people started asking how. They started gathering around and, uh, will you give us like a card or something? And, and we said, like, for what? How, como vamos a salir de la casa? We started laughing also, but it, it, but it, it was serious stuff for them. And then that's the other thing that I have learned from all the years from the Mexicali Bayani, from deconstructing the model of Taking the pieces out of, to the to the to independent spaces to the public to the rent directly to the to the barrio uh, has given me a glimpse of how things are received also and, and the power that we have as installers and as artists as curators and the possibilities that this makes the thing <laughs> and it was. Uh, the first time I also saw some performances, live performances, like the, the one that, the, uh, 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 yeah, your sister, uh, Rebecca Hernandez, and the <coughs> choreographers made in a little swimming pool inside the house, uh, and found a, a, a local band from, uh, from uh, high school played like uh, the Igno uh, Nacional Mexicano, but but with, with other, like, very festive and stuff. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's what mind-blowing how, how things change in an in a independent space and in, in a, how do you call it, uh, institution, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, you can do it. Yeah, we'll give it to us. Yeah, because uh, that was a, a, a mural we did in, in Logan, Barrio Logan in San Diego. Mm -hmm. A lot of work that year, uh, and then we had another show in 2012. Yeah, more more formal show, four artists only, but with a special request to to have uh, more violence in the, in the yard because Mexico was very violent, and they wanted to see how violent 
it was. We we had a show but with, with a lot of pieces that were very, very violent. Uh, and uh, it, it was a very big contrast because uh, we didn't felt like it was as violent as every, everybody thinks. Still, up to date, many people at the US think that Mexico is very violent, but we think also that maybe the US also is. Or anybody <laughs> uh, this is a very a great example of what we made on that show. Mm. It was, yeah, very, very difficult and violent pieces from Ramon Carrillo on one side and a very nice uh, calm down piece of uh, Pablo Castaneda who's also over there. Uh, and he had that vision of, of the border, uh, like a fiesta, like an uh, like, uh, old cinema, like Hollywood, like uh, everything that, that we have the possibility of having, the good things about the US, the good things about Mexico, and also that you have also uh, like the good things of me. That's the border for us, not, not, not the other thing. And then came the, the, the Vincent Price uh, show, uh, again reinventing itself, the biennial, showing me, because this is my, my perspective of, of, of things, showing me how you could do very, very different things in, in, the, in a short period of time. And uh, in show, uh, another showcase, uh, 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 very different stuff, uh, evo the evolution of art uh, in a very short period of time. That was mesmerizing in that show. That piece in particular, the, the, the cleanness, the, the, the way everything is uh, set up, that gave me a very big visual impact as an installer to, to have the possibility to do that. Uh, uh, with an idea of an, of an artist. So I'm be, I've been very influenced by uh, Mexicali Biennial and the deconstruction of the, of the biennial uh, structure or uh, paradigma. Uh, and I try to apply it in my work. That piece in particular, uh, that, that house, uh, that white picket fence house, and when you get in, you see that the, what do you call it? Yeah, in the shackles. The shackles. And uh, it, it immediately reminded me of my brother, who was an illegal immigrant at that time, and, and how he cannot go out of the house because she was illegal. He was illegal. Like, and, but then when I see the post that it's not completed up until the, I said, well, he has a choice also. We all have a choice. Uh, so again, I, I see I, I see these pieces that uh, talk to me uh, in a different way, or I can see a lot of information that I know it's, it has to. It means because of uh, my background or my culture, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that's the way that I have to see art, uh, and everybody we have to see it like that. Uh, we have to. Uh, well, we do so. How can we as installers, or as, as curators, as artists, can work to bring the best message to the people? That's the, that's the thing that we are working on. I think everybody, and, and that's the cool thing about this type of gatherings, that we can do that. Uh, we did another show in Mexicali with Greg, and now he, we, he did the show in, in Mexicali. Look at his his work is very formal, very very traditional. But his theme is uh, like the outskirts, the the, the, the urban art. Uh, he had invited some of uh, some other guys that I, I think I saw in, at the opening. Uh, Oscar Madagan is here. I, I, we did a show with him. He, he, that's type of work. That's his work. It was very impressive for me to have to have the opportunity to work with him in the installation of his pieces in Mexicali, and uh, I think uh, uh, all the art 
it's more formal, but his pieces were like the ones that I have been seeing in, in the Mexicali Biennial or when in independent spaces. So I think it's what it was very important to, to work directly with him in the installation of his pieces and how what he wanted to like uh, comment about uh, his pieces. Mm. Yeah, well, that's one of the other shows that we made, uh, and uh, it was a Mexicali Rose, the independent space. Uh, uh, it was artists from LA and, and, and Tijuana, and we saw other type of stuff. Uh, well, the, the graffiti, the right in the wall of the, of the gallery, the, the use of uh, old technology like like gifts and stuff, but now with a new uh, implement, uh, that actually fell down and broke. <laughs> because we couldn't, we couldn't. Uh, the, the the ceiling was too heavy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, and the, uh, the possibility of see like new new pieces that we haven't seen in. in I, I kind of uh, and the live band, the the performance, live performance and stuff. Uh, we started to incorporate that on our shows, also, and, and it was a lot of, uh, we had a lot of people going on the shows, attracted a lot of people. This piece in particular, uh, I I wanted to, to you to see it because we made that show in Seattle also and. Uh, <coughs> The piece of the shoes, is, is, uh, these are shoes collected of uh, illegal immigrants in different points of, uh, of the border. And the other piece supposedly are uh, gallons of water that have been used for, uh, for the purpose of staying alive. Uh, two powerful pieces that again have a message and what the artist wanted was uh, how to express them, and we came up with like that kind of setting for the gallons and stuff. And I think it, it made a very contemporary piece, and with the light and everything, it was uh, like a big hit. That's the last show we have have had in, in Aroca. Uh, you notice that the art is not that violent, or we try to to show other things. Uh, maybe outskirts, uh, maybe illegal immigrants, uh, maybe tacos, uh, like our dear friend uh, Roger who died a couple of years ago. But uh, I think it's part of uh, uh, what we have to do is change perspectives uh, with art also. So we try not to, violence is everywhere and it still is and in Mexico it's a very big part of Mexico, so we don't have to. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we don't have to like keep it. It's okay. Yeah. A couple of years. Ago. Yeah, and just to provide a little more context or transition as well, you know. <clears throat> uh, I'm really excited to hear from Alejandro as well, just because allowing him to talk about, you know, the historical, cultural, artistic, and like political um, context for art making in the borderlands, but also in relationship to the biennial too. So I, I, um, feel free to take it away, Alejandro, and share some of your insights. Can you look at it now? Yes. Yes? Okay. I will begin with that. As I will say, in the mid 2010, a group of students and I decided to make an art exhibit in the making box. It was a separate demolished building beside a condemned municipal market, which traced the debris, flattened the floor, and hung and or the artworks in the remaining walls of the site. During the cleanup, one of the students found a considerable amount of plastic bottles of fine yarn. 
he made a TV specifically for that show. Each's artwork was accompanied by a spray painted logo that says Mao Xi. A satirical comment on the web scene, a government initiative that is Mexican and Golden Black Friday. Some pieces were sold to a couple of people who happened to pass by the one day exhibit. About a week later, a student took the following picture of that same site. As a way of establishing a social, political, and historical account of the manner in which art production in Baja California has evolved in the past 50 years, the members of Maxi Gallery and not yet biennial invited me to venture into the sensible task of writing a deep analysis of the creating a sort of standardized reflection that links both the social history of the region and the cultural history of the production. A history that began as a continuation of the, de of the development in Mexican modern art history. In the series of ruptures, features, and disruptions that came forth to the present contemporary art scene practice. My involvement in these developments has been through a series of academic and independent activities that revolve around art writing, art making, teaching, curating, and offering as a sort of cultural agent that is involved with various independent and institutional organizations. During my 20 plus years participating in a long series of events and civic and cultural projects, I have the privilege of studying both the organic network of artists and cultural supporters in Baja California, as well as the evolution of art practice along the border. This experience has also given me the chance to provide a critical historical perspective regarding aesthetic production in the region. The perspective of the that to me is both the social history of the region in its cultural and aesthetic production are some of it. But a series of common threads that revolve around what I can see as liminality and the process of deconstructing institutional models for exhibiting art. Liminality in the sense that both art production and the aesthetic, formal, and political strategies for their exhibition fall into a zone of indistinguishability, where intentionality of expression is Addition of important historical relevance to the art form are blurred by the professional evolution, progress, and reinvention of the landscape's urban areas and economic initiatives that shape the idiosyncrasy and social impulses of the people who inhabit the border. The construction in the sense that the model discourses the institutional protocols that define the historical determinant category of our activity from the salon to the review, from the retrospective to the biennial, are scrutinized and redefined as instances for multiple unstable possibilities regarding the experience of creating and exhibiting musical art. It is designated by the confluence of both actors in their exchange of strategies and left of center initiatives for making and exhibiting art, an experience that lies at the margins of the cultural institution the latter remaining as both external spectators and sometimes collaborators of these dynamics. To begin from artists, you can find that the, the following characterization. First of all, they are cross-generational, they're unschooled in the sense that there's not a particular tendency or school of, of thought or aesthetic uh, guidelines as uh, make the uh, the artist sort of like develop or evolve around that that uh, collective or or sort of like a internalized notion. There is also an intention, an unpretentious that mm -hmm. establishes the moral imperative, but also inclines towards contextual universalism regarding language, form, perception, and their understanding of territory. Their art stems from a traditional approach to art thinking, but some of them have come to a series of disruptions regarding their original position. They are autonomous intellectually, aesthetically, and politically. They are instigators, instigators and scholars for undetected California spirit and ethos. 
There are even times to produce home and home technology in the form of urban legends and picaresque characterizations. There are also really non attentive to, to their unhistorical past. In the case of independent spaces, they are located in the, on the interstices of the, the urban sprawl, from abandoned commercial and house friendly spontaneous and in the urban city. They are all collective enterprises, they are multifunctional, they are precariously and or crowdfunded. There's a DIY aesthetic both in a museum bracket and curatorial sense. They are communal in nature. They are divided, diversified, non-determined, and there's a diversified, non-determined experience surrounding. For example, we can talk about uh, Casa de la Pedina, and what briefly began as a music event was soon taken over by a collective of artists that even sent cultural supporters that refurbished the grounds of an old home and turned it into an independent art space and cultural center creating the blueprint for a future independent art space in the next time. This is what the arrow letter. This is one of the first Mexican biennials to play. Then there was Mexican Rose, located in one of the oldest parts of the town. The Sorcerer originally conceived, conceived as a film and video to the young members of the community, but soon found itself at the epicenter of a cultural and artistic shift they transformed it into a gallery, radio station, and public call for political and social conference. The event that Frankie County Biennial organized in this venue were an integral part of its process. Then there are other spaces, such as Postal, Arte Contemporáneo, located in a commercial premise that was taken over by the homeless population of Frankie County Center. Postal Arte Contemporáneo was one of the first independent spaces that focused specifically on conceptual art installation. A few years later, we find this place called I-21, which is what's located inside of Swapney, and exhibited installation are alongside a myriad of miscellaneous stores that surround it. It's also the case of the Proceso, which one of the guiding political and aesthetic principles at this place is that they didn't use the wall labels for the exterior seat. And sometimes they didn't even uh, exhibit a, a sort of like a gallery space that sort of the guidelines for the, the, the nature or intention of the city. And so instinctive, critical, communal, conspirative, experimental, and improvisational in nature. Our production and exhibition in Mexico U.S. border the past few five years is the result of an evolving redefinition of what art can provoke for the transformation of the community through the series of disruptive experiences that Mexicali Biennial has been an integral part. This is where I stop my presentation. And, uh, Alejandro, thank you so much. I think um, even in our conversation early this week, can you hear me, Alejandro? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, when we were talking about how to frame this um, this panel, thinking about anti-biennial, thinking about constructing and deconstructing exhibition models. You said something that really yeah. stuck with that stuck with me, Alejandro, about this balance between sharing anecdotes. You know. Um, artist, curator, preparator, art installer um, experiences, and also thinking about history and theoretical or conceptual frameworks for understanding where we all navigate, right? And I think that um, your presentation was very um, succinct, but really poignant in, sh in, t in showing us, right? Both the importance of alternative art spaces, but all of these contexts that shape production um, of art uh, by people who live and inhabit the borderlands, right? Um, and so uh, I do have, you know, circling back to this idea of anti-biennial, and biennials are on my mind, of course, for those of us who work in Los Angeles, made in LA, um, the artists <laughs> uh, were announced uh, yesterday. 
with respect to our, our colleagues who work there, you know, thinking about uh, this idea of critiquing a, a biennial and, and what is its um, function and how do museums or, or organizations that organize biennials see their, their role, right? And, and critiques of it perhaps being um, a historical or shaped by frameworks that might be too general or not culturally specific enough or you know, open-ended um, or also supplanting itself in a particular city or community that does not always uh, uh, bear recognition or acknowledgement to the communities you know, that live and, and work in the city. Um, and this is in general, not specific, right? <laughs> but you know, to think about uh, Mexicali Baño as, as another model um, but also uh, hijacking, <laughs> as we talked, uh, and you know, hijacking a model in service not of market or institution or uh, field, but to artists and community. And so I, I would love, um, if you know, to open it up uh, to the panel to talk about uh, what it's been like navigating, you know. Uh, these different spaces, many different venues, both as relate as it relates to the Mexicali Biennial, but also separately, um, and being a witness to supporting artists make art that has an impact on, on a community or like everyday level. I mean, Israel, I'm thinking about some of the reflections that you shared um, from producing and, and working on so many different projects, um, but certainly open it up. <laughs> Let me to Oh. Okay, Israel, go ahead. I think having the possibility of working at an institution and having a biennial structure uh, as, an, as, a, as we have in Baja California, and having the possibility of working at independent spaces and with uh, the anti biennial, uh, I have a very clear sense of what both mean. Uh, one for the institution means uh, uh, keeping the, the heritage of uh, the Baja California art per se. Uh, uh, maybe I think, on a very personal level, that yeah, it is uh, like a uh, un modelo gastado, si, uh, that maybe we should change a lot of things. Well, we, we have. Uh, the last uh, couple of years, the, the the most recent biennial in 2021 was very different from the other ones that we had before, and it's mainly because of uh, working with the deconstruction of uh, of of the the structure that that we have. Uh, Alejandro had had. Uh, had the opportunity to work in that in that uh, biennial, and uh, and he, we know what we are talking about because of what the results were. <coughs> Mainly, we don't have uh, very traditional uh, art uh, as uh, as we had before, and the the prices went to to more uh, uh, installations and performance art which is great for, uh, for this possibility to, to, to evolve in the, in, in, in like the art world is evolving. Uh, the other one is that uh, if, if you work for a lot of, uh, for a very big period of time in an institution, uh, you tend to think that it's wrong. I personally don't think that because I have, as I said before, this opportunity to work uh, many times outside, and I have a, a, another perspective. Uh, but yeah, my, my my colleagues at work think uh, that uh, that it's wrong to to have a piece that is uh, made uh, not in the traditional sense of of, uh, of a painting, for, uh, as an example. Uh, so uh, uh, I think. Uh, for the means of the, I mean, for the sake of the institution, uh, well, the institution can do anything it, it wants, basically. 
Uh, but I hope that yeah, we we opened up and and see these new models of, uh, of uh, gathering art for for the purposes of uh, of the next generations. Yeah, it will because there's no other way. We're gonna be stuck with museum art, and we are actually not a museum. So I don't. It's a it's a thing that we don't really understand. Plus, our collection of art. Which is very big right now. We hope we have, a, I think, more than a thousand pieces. Uh, it's uh, mainly from the 60s, 70s. I mean, no, not really. From the 80s to, to mm -hmm. right now. So, so we we don't actually have a collection, a historical collection per se. I think um, I think that's a good the question that you were talking about, and then also to, to piggyback on that, like the institution has the power, the biennial has the power. Then what happens if that if you're outside of that framework as an individual artist, as an underrepresented you know, member of a community? Um, who are the gatekeepers, and how can you create opportunities for yourself? I think when we started the the, the Mexicali biennial was under this uh, a period of time where no one wanted another biennial when everyone was telling us, call it, call it anything but a biennial, call it the whatever biennial or with the whatever, you know. But it, it, if we were to have done that, we would have just been another exhibition. So I think with, using the term biennial was a very strategic and political uh, action that was taken in order to contextualize and create uh, context around an exhibition would automatically create um, or, or allow the viewer to see it in a different way. Um, and the, the notion of the, the ready-made as being an anti-art object uh, historically now is a recognized, understood uh, art object and strategy. Uh, and the biennial has also developed that way too, where, we, where at one point we were self-funded, it was DIY, um, out, uh, working outside the institution in alternative spaces, and now we're a nonprofit arts organization. Uh, and uh, thankful to have opportunities here uh, to show at the at the G20 Center for Chicano Art and Culture. But that being said, we also do work uh, outside of uh, established institutions in smaller gallery spaces, doing impromptu you know, actions and performances. Um, so I think I think for us it was this uh, opportunity to to understand that we all have agency, that we can create opportunities for ourselves, especially when the institution isn't creating opportunities for you. And in doing that, we build community and create opportunities for, in, in which everyone that participates is able to, to benefit from. Sorry, but I, I have a, you have a very big point. Uh, why is that when, when a project starts to develop yeah. and, and starts to be big, people tend to think, well, he doesn't need money anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> why why, why we, do we have that sense that Oh, you've been to New York and to Berlin, and you don't need money. Yes, I do. I can go further <laughs> to other places, right? So that, that's a big point. Alejandro, do you have anything you want? OK, uh, just um, a quick, sort of like a historical roundup, in, in which I, I, I'm trying to pinpoint exactly what the role of Mexicali Biennial has been in all of this. First of all, let's, let us remember that the, the Biennial model is uh, European in nature. It was originally intended as a, as a sort of like a uh, two-year analysis or diagnosis of uh, the state of the art in the sense of what, are the, what were the main tendencies and the main topics that artists were beginning to to uh, express throughout their, their works. However, the, uh, the, the export or the import of this concept uh, in uh, cultural institutions, especially in the peripheral areas, not included in the center of our country, of Mexico, which is Mexico City, uh, began to develop a, a, a very different nature. And the, 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 the original conception of a biennial in our cultural institutions is more alike a salon, a art salon, in the sense that uh, it's, a, it's an open contest 
everyone can can uh, can uh, bring their their work, and there's not a there's not really a, a conceptual or curatorial curatorial or thematic yeah. framework. Uh, also, there isn't uh, an intention to make a, a diagnosis of the state of the art, just uh, a reunion or a collection of artists who are producing art in a particular region. So it became sort of a context. And what I think is really interesting is that Mexicali Valleno, understanding the, the perception of this concept in our locality, made it sort of a uh, uh, claim or an appropriation of the concept of biennial, uh, sort of like uh, interrupting the manner in which the same concept was used in a cultural institution. And so, in a sense, by, by it deconstructed the formal or the original uh, conception of biennial that the cultural institutions in Baja California have. And, and sort of like a proposed their own conception of what a biennial could be in this in these territories. In the process, the uh, the thematical frameworks, the concept, and the curatorial initiative uh, started to develop a series or, or created a series of exhibits that made uh, a lot of spectators, most of them artists or local artists, to try and they, they got to be revealed of the fact that these kinds of practices were actually able to do on an independent map. It's like most of these artists had little or no contact with the actual exhibit of, of uh, artworks that that, uh, that had a contemporary idiom to them. And to see them displayed on the exhibit made them realize, oh, I can I can also do that. You know? I can also uh, take my work, my ideas, my projects towards uh, languages, forms, and, and, and idioms that uh, are not necessarily related to the traditional conception of what art and artwork is, which is sort of like the, the, the historical paradigm shift that began more or less as by, the, by the second edition of the Mexicali Biennial in, in Mexicali this morning. No, thank you, because I think, you, and I really appreciate the kind of historical context that you provide as well when we're talking about what the history of Biennial and how it functions, mm -hmm. and also how this project uh, can play by those rules and also throw them away. <laughs> At the same time, I love to think about yeah. an ands versus ors, right? Um, the mm -hmm. way that, you know, uh, and I, I will turn it over to questions, I know we're, we're running out of time, but, you know, the way that this project through its iterations and its locations and its longevity has actually supported um, so many artists right and, and also cultivated community um, and also just provided uh, to speak to your point Ed when we were talking earlier this week like here's a here's a model here's a case study of, of what you can do to pro to showcase work um, it, it art as, as part of your community um, and it's in a way that also has um, cultural value, community value, and, and a sense of cultural specificity too, um, that, that makes it really unique, right? That makes it different from a, a traditional uh, biennial in that sense. Um, I would like to pass it over just to see, you know, um, if there are members of the audience that would have a question for anyone on the panel. Um, yeah, sure, I think we have one or two. In the back, or no? no. Go for it. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Right, so thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I want to get back to this issue of power in the museum that you were starting with, particularly around the, the hammer biennial. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the core 
issue there is that the museum and these biennials continue to be places that are legitimating, and they're places where we must go to be visibilized and go to be legitimated. And what's been so important, I think, in listening to what the work that Mexicali does is its emphasis on alternative spaces, as I've heard throughout the presentation. Um, what, and so much of the work has been in saying that these spaces also are legitimate. But I, within the market, those spaces are unable to legitimate artists and to increase the value of their work. And I think that this is a core issue because as we've been talking about, the work that you do is so valuable, but it's also so precarious. And we've talked repeatedly about money and the money issue. And until there is a sort of equalization of these art spaces where we can go to, let's say, La Casa de la Piatina or, or whatever it was, right, and say that you know when you exhibit here, it also increases the value of the work, I don't see a way forward in regards to creating some amount of stability. And so I was wondering what your thoughts were, because you're obviously right at the, the forefront of this, thinking through all of these issues, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are on, on the sort of the politics of geography, ultimately, and how that, that plays into uh, legitimating and delegitimating uh, artworks and values and things like that. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I think that that's a really good point to make. And I think for us it was, um, being able to hijack the word biennial and its context, right? You know, you, I'm immediately thinking, you know, Whitney Biennial, uh, Sao Paulo Biennial, uh, Venice Biennale. Uh, <laughs> and, and it goes on and on and on, right? But, but you know, obviously we we're not, uh, at the, when we started out, we weren't backed by an institution, dealers, uh, representatives, galleries, or anything like that. Um, and it was very much about um, going where the love was. You know, the institution wasn't inviting us. Um, curators weren't um, allowing us access. So how could we create those situations for ourselves? And in doing that, um, change the context of those alternative spaces, right? Um, because now that alternative space that was a burnt out and haunted uh, uh, garage uh, is now hosting a binational exhibition with artists from uh, all throughout California and Mexico. Uh, with no money, no funding, but what we did have, which was probably even more valuable, was community. You know, and it's a case study in how you can do sometimes more with very little, if you create situations, if you grow community, and you create situations where everybody can benefit. Right to the point where now, in 2023, we're talking about La Casa de la Piatina, when in 2006 it was just this you know, punk venue where, where you know, you know, very, very, very underground, very rough. Um, and I think that's the power of the, the, the creatives have, where we can create situations for ourselves, especially when the institution isn't doing it for us. And in a way, we have to become the institution. Right? Instead of trying to find where you can insert yourself into a center, you create the center and then the, the uh, community revolves around that. Uh, and that can be done um, very easily with money, but it also can be done uh, with community with having partners and collaborators that come together because we all have the same goal in mind. And then finding situations where everybody can benefit. And I think when you have that mix, you can do very much with very little. Yeah, well, uh, we started like uh, Mexicali when started. Uh, I mean, I work for an institution. I've been there 26 years, but the first shows that we made or, uh, at uh, OCA, at the uh, Centro Cultural La Raza, uh, the Aztlán show we made in, in Galeria Da in, in Pomona many years ago. We funded it with our own means. Uh, I mean, the artist uh, had a, a little jeep and we used to put up the artwork there and cross the border and, and eat something uh, at Burger King and uh, install the show, do the, the opening go back to Mexico and uh, a month later come back and do the same thing, to take it uh, back. So, uh, and, and then we started working more with independent spaces in Mexicali and, uh, and some spaces got bigger and bigger and bigger, others disappeared, like Casa de la Diatina, but Mexicali Rose became so big that we went to the Berlin Art Fair, we went to Munich, we went to Washington, we went to New York at our artist space uh, and do, did a show there and co-curated a show uh, and it was like the big leagues. 
And we came back to Mexicali and they said, you know what, we don't have money anymore. We don't have to, how to pay rent or how to pay, uh, we don't have to, how to pay the bills. Oh, you, you don't need money, you, you went to New York. <laughs> well, so uh, that happens. Uh, sadly, uh, the independent spaces disappear. Uh, I remember in 2007, I met Man One. Some of you know Man One, right? He had a very important gallery in Los Angeles. And it was a shock for me to see he closed the gallery because of funding in those years, I think 2010 or something like that. And I was like, what? He's Man One, he, he, he already made it. And no, he has other projects, right? As all as we all do, we all evolve and do something else, but but it's difficult, and uh, that's what we try so hard to help out these guys. So, well, plus we all are friends now, so <laughs> we are like a, we're like a big family, uh, Mexico and Mexicali and LA and Tijuana and uh, every every everywhere. Yeah, we, we, we talk about how uh, um, the LA is, is to Mexicali what Tijuana is to San Diego, right? Um, and I, another thing that I think is really important, especially for young artists, is this idea that any space is cool. You don't need a beautiful white gallery space and tons of money to do some really exciting, amazing, and, and, and groundbreaking work, right? But when you have it, it's, it's also very cool. If you have this, <laughs> I mean, well, if we have both. this opportunity is, is, is great, but they've already made it. So I hope they, they go forward and, and make better things. And we are involved in those, those, those things. Everybody here, uh, we will come back in two or three years, maybe, or, or, or something. <laughs> and we, maybe we will talk about what happened in those two or three years. It will be great. That's the idea of not this or that, but both. Yeah, I, I would, I, and I know we have to wrap up, but I would just say that it's also this um, thinking about the different venues. It's, it's very telling to see where Mexico has mm -hmm. been historically, and also I'm thinking about Southern California venues like a lot of college art spaces, right? Um, I work at a college art museum. I fundamentally believe that there's is we grapple a very important um, border in the sense of these. We are an institution but we're also feel like we're a community space, right? And, you know, I'm proud to, to see the show here and see so many artists that we've worked with over the years, right? And so I definitely believe in the long run <laughs> also part of equation here where it's not like you're gonna be in the show and next thing you know you're you're making the millions and you're going to Berlin. But, <laughs> but, but you know, who says you can't be in, in, in made in LA too, you know? I don't know. <laughs>
Well, I think that's that's about our time. So um, I encourage you all to continue the conversation. We're going to have lunch today here, and so you know, see any of us and keep the conversation going. But we'll transition to our next panel. Oh, we'll take a five minute break. So thank you all so much. And thank you, Alejandro, for zooming in. We're so grateful for your for your participation too.